let us gavel in and begin. As this hearing is, vir is fully virtual, we must address a few housekeeping matters. For today's meeting, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If I notice that you have not unmuted yourself, I may ask you if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicated approval by nodding, staff will then go ahead and unmute your microphone. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there is a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You will notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn to yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time is almost expired. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. In terms of the speaking order, we will begin with the chair and ranking member and members present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized in order of seniority. And then finally, members not present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized. Finally, the house rules require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings or markups. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. The subcommittee shall come to order. Good afternoon. Today, we welcome the Secretary of Commerce Ms. Gina Raimondo, in her first appearance before this subcommittee to testify on the Department of Commerce's fiscal year 2022 budget request. Thank you for being with us today, Madam Secretary. The President's fiscal year 2022 budget request proposes a bold $2.5 billion increase to the Department of Commerce's budget to further its vital role in our nation's economic recovery following the pandemic. The request focuses on American jobs, businesses, and manufacturing, as well as ensuring a safe supply chain, the continuation of keeping America competitive in a global trade market, and finally, restoring America's position as a global leader in semiconductor production. Additionally, the request invests in our future by increasing broadband deployment so everyone has the opportunity to participate in our modern economy and education system. The request also includes initiatives in weather, climate, and oceans research and services that will improve our resiliency to climate change and create jobs and prosperity. Our global competitors and adversaries will often seek to undermine or circumvent our trade laws, steal our intellectual property, and impose retaliatory tariffs or other barriers to trade. Bureaus such as the International Trade Administration play an important role in protecting American businesses and industries from unfair trade practices that directly impact American workers. That is why I'm glad to see a continued commitment to ensuring staffing and resources for the department's bureaus focused on both trade enforcement and export controls in the top line budget. And while our hearing today will focus on the budget request, we will also want to discuss other areas of general oversight concerning the Department of Commerce. I look forward to hearing more about requirements for the U.S. Census Bureau as it continues to roll out the 2020 decennial census results. It goes without saying that the Census Bureau had an enormous, unprecedented task in conducting its operations in the midst of a global pandemic, but concerns persist around a potential undercount, especially of those in hard to count and minority communities. I would also like to hi highlight a couple of other issues. First, when the pandemic struck, the Office of Management and Budget sent Congress a formal letter requesting supplemental funds to deal with internal impacts of that upheaval. 
for whatever reason, the Commerce Department was one of the only federal agencies that the previous administration chose not to include in that request. This oversight has squeezed your budgets and hampered several initiatives. I hope this administration will not let that sort of thing happen again. Second, I want to make sure you're aware of ongoing issues with hiring, most notably, notably at NOAA. Your proposal includes an increase of $1.4 billion for NOAA, which would certainly necessitate considerable hiring. The current delays in onboarding new staff is incompatible with the president's climate goals. So my advice to you is that you begin to address that problem right away. We need NOAA to play a very big role in addressing climate change. So they need to be firing on all cylinders. Any organization is only as good as its people, so please make streamlining the hiring process a priority. Well, we look forward to receiving the full budget request from the administration in the near future. What we know based on the initial top line request illustrates a serious commitment to reinvesting in the improvement of the overall quality of life for the American people and restoring America's competitiveness and position as a leader in the global economy. And we know this proposed investment will only be augmented by funding from the administration's Americans Jobs Plan. I am looking forward to hearing more from you on how the American Jobs Plan will work in concert with the budget proposal. And now I'd like to yield the floor for the opening statement from our distinguished ranking member, Mr. Adderholt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's uh, good to be with you today. Uh, thank you for yielding. And I appreciate you holding this uh, hearing today. And I'm pleased to uh, be joining the, the subcommittee today to hopefully learn more about the Department of Commerce's FY 2022 20, discretionary budget, uh, as, you, as you rightly mentioned. First, I would like to also welcome Secretary uh, Raimondo for her inaugural hearing before the Commerce, Justice and Science Subcommittee. It's uh, great to have you here today. Congratulations on your new role as Secretary. Uh, Ms. Raimondo, your stewardship uh, of the department is important to our nation, all of our communities, and we sincerely do wish you the best. I wholeheartedly support the department's efforts to promote job creation and economic competitiveness, and to protect our nation's innovators and manufacturers from unfair trade practices. Uh, in the last few years, the Commerce Department has stood up more for manufacturing jobs in Alabama and across the United States than I believe any time in recent history. I hope and indeed expect that you will continue to make America industry a top priority. As you well know, beyond fostering jobs and opportunities for the people of North Alabama and across our state and across our nation, the Commerce Department also oversees many other important programs. This includes critical activities at NOAA, including the provision of daily weather forecast, severe storm warnings, and climate monitoring, along with the efforts to support fisheries and foster marine commerce. The important work being done by the Alabama Water Center and the Vortex North Southeast program remains critical to people of my state and also my district. In addition, the Department of the National Institute of Standards and Technology works to advance measurement of science standards and technology in the ways that enhance economic security and improve our quality of life. NIST mission is truly at the forefront of many of the most exciting and life-altering technological advancements in the world today. These are just a few of the many important missions at the Commerce Department, and I hold them in high regard. And while the scarce budget details have been provided fall short, I have taken note of the administration's summary for the Department of Commerce and the program increases you've highlighted. Unfortunately, it's impossible to, uh, to assess or if there's going to be trade-offs that are being made. Nevertheless, 
I believe there will be opportunities to find agreement on measures that help advance manufacturing and also innovation to improve weather forecasting, spur much needed economic development as well. But going forward, I, and I strongly encourage you to put forth a budget submission with a serious focus on developing and implementing a strong export control strategy that matches the enormity of the threat that's posed by China. And I further urge a greater focus on addressing unfair foreign trade practices and barriers that harm U.S. workers and businesses. I look forward to discussing these and many of other important matters with you today during our hearing. And I will have uh, questions about trade enforcement, particularly when it comes to aluminum, the importance of securing our microelectronic supply chain and the Office of Space Commerce, just to name a few. We want to work with you to ensure that the programs you administer are as effective and that they are as safe as possible. And I look forward to working with our chairman, Chairman Cartwright, uh, and our full committee chairman uh, to make sure that we do everything to support the many missions that is under the Department of Commerce in this year's appropriations process and as it does move forward. Uh, we sincerely appreciate you uh, being here with us and making yourself available this afternoon. We look forward to receiving the department's complete budget submission in time to thoroughly review it before the chair commences of the markup effort. So again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, yielding this afternoon, and I look forward to the hearing. Well, thank you, Mr. Adderhold. Uh, at this time, uh, it is my pleasure now to turn to the chair of the full committee, Representative DeLauro, for any statements she would like to make at this time. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member Adderholt, uh, for holding this hearing. And I want to uh, welcome uh, Secretary Raimondo for your first appearance before this uh, subcommittee. I also might add it was such a great pleasure to welcome you to Connecticut earlier this week uh, as we talked more in depth about the profound ways in which registered apprenticeships and job training programs can help furnish our workers with the resources and the skills that they need to build successful careers uh, and a path to a brighter and a more prosperous future. So thank you so much for being in Connecticut. Uh, I deeply appreciate the work you are doing to build back better, revitalize our workforce and the American economy uh, following the devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I am so grateful for the work you have been doing, especially as it relates uh, to women and in the strengthening of the care economy. While I know this is not something specifically within the jurisdiction of the Department of Commerce, I do want to stress the importance of addressing the issues we have seen in the child care economy that have been further exacerbated by this pandemic so that women and mothers can go back to work. Um, as, as you know, the recent release of the 2020 census results showed a somewhat surprising drop in the birth rate. Uh, this is despite surveys, uh, surveys that show that women want to have as many babies as ever. So I think there's no doubt that this is in due in large part to the so-called she session and the lack of childcare, daycare, and educational resources for American families across the income spectrum. So again, I think this is particularly important part of what you are doing. Uh, Madam Secretary, in your work to bring back our economy and to create jobs. But let me turn more specifically to the Biden administration's funding request for the Department of Commerce. As you know, the 2022 discretionary request for the department is, uh, is $11.4 billion, a 28% increase. It includes significant increases for the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, the Manufacturing uh, Extension Partnership Program, Minority Business Development Agency, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Administration. As someone from a coastal district, I know very well how important it is for NOAA to continue investing in climate resilience and supporting coastal communities. Uh, this funding request also includes $500 million over 2021 for the next generation of NOAA satellites, incorporating a diverse array of new technologies, uh, which would improve data for weather and climate forecasts and provide critical information to the public. Finally, in addition to these specific funding pr uh, proposals, the administration is also sending a strong signal that support for trade enforcement and addressing unfair trade practices will continue. 
I fully believe that these important initiatives, coupled with further investments in American jobs, uh, uh, will spur the economic growth, create jobs, and it will play a crucial role in revitalizing uh, our economy. Uh, and I look forward to learning more about the administration's plans for the future. So let me say thank you again to you, Secretary Raimondo, and for all your tireless work for joining us to discuss these critical issues. And let me say a thank you to Chairman Cartwright and Ranking Member Adderholt, and I yield back. Thank you, Chair DeLauro. At this time, Secretary Raimondo, I'm gonna recognize you for five minutes of, an, uh, of your testimony. Uh, the clock is uh, visible to you, I believe, and uh, we ask that you abide by that and, and don't worry about leaving out points because uh, we will be including your entire written testimony in the permanent record. At this time, Secretary Raimondo, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. It is a great pleasure for me to be here with you and to those of you who I haven't met in person, I look forward to doing that soon. Uh, Chairman Cartwright and Chair DeLauro, Ranking Member Adderholt, members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to discuss President Biden's fiscal year 2022 discretionary request for the Department of Commerce. As has been said already, the president's request includes an $11.4 billion for the Department of Commerce, which is a 27% increase above the 21 enacted level, so a reasonably significant increase. With these funds, we will be able to maintain existing programs, but also make critical investments necessary to boost the nation's ability to address the crises we face today. And I will say, we all have the task of working through the appropriations process in light of uh, incredible crises. We are facing four simultaneous crises of unprecedented scope. First, a once in a century pandemic that has already claimed the lives of a half a million Americans. Second, an economic crisis that has been punishing and still we have nearly 10 million people out of work. Third, a national reckoning on race inequality. And fourth, the growing threat of climate change to the American people and economy. The Department of Commerce will play an integral role in addressing each of these crises. As some of you had mentioned, NIST uh, has already been critical. NIST research has developed a way to increase the sensitivity and accuracy of the common swab test for COVID-19. The EDA has already awarded more than a billion dollars in grants to help communities and businesses across the country recover from the economic crisis. The MBDA enabled technical assistance programs to help minority business enterprises execute on about $8 billion in transactions in 2020. And NOAA continues to save lives and property by providing early warning systems and decision support tools to avoid the most devastating impacts of extreme weather events, many of which, I don't have to tell you, are increasing in frequency and intensity, of course, due to climate change. Um, I'm very proud of the work that the department has done and is doing to confront these crises, but I, I am very aware of the challenges that remain and the president's discretionary request puts forward significant investments to help us do the work necessary to build back better after these crises. I look forward to talking with you over the next however many minutes, but permit me for a second just to highlight a few of the key initiatives included in the increased discretionary request. Uh, first, there is significant investment, additional investment in manufacturing, including in the Manufacturing Innovation Institutes Program and the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. There's additional money for EDA, including in the assistance to coal communities, substantial investments in NOAA to ensure that we have top-notch um, climate science, observation, forecasting, and research, improvements in weather and climate, um, and also uh, additional investments in NIST to spur research and technological innovation 
by expanding scientific and technical research. As many of you said, we have to lean in to improve our nation's competitiveness. We have to make our decisions based upon science. We have to um, make our decisions with an eye towards equity. And I look forward to working with all of you uh, to create jobs, spur growth, and do it in a way that supports American businesses and workers now and into the future. I'm very happy to take your questions. Well, thank you, Secretary Raimondo. And before we get into the question period, I would like to extend an invitation to you to visit my own district in Northeastern Pennsylvania to meet with our local businesses, see the potential for growth in our area and understand our economic development needs. I do hope we can find a conven convenient time for that, perhaps this summer or fall when most of the COVID restrictions have been lifted. Can I count on you to visit Northeastern Pennsylvania? I, absolutely. I would say um, I, I actually love being out in the community. I was with Chair Deloro, as she said earlier, this week in Connecticut. Last week I was in New Hampshire. And it's important to hear from the people that we serve. So thank you. I, I believe that. I'm, when you're in Rhode Island, if you take one wrong turn, you're in Connecticut. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> um, I'm going to recognize that would be a right turn uh, there. That would be a right turn coming to Connecticut, Cartwright. <laughs> I, I stand corrected, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm going to recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Uh, Secretary Raimondo, in his American Jobs Plan, President Biden has proposed $50 billion for a new office in the Department of Commerce, quote, dedicated to monitoring domestic industrial capacity and funding investments to support production of critical goods, unquote. No additional details have been provided so far on this proposal. So the first question is, can you provide more information on the specific activities um, this planned new Commerce Department office is to support? Uh, is the $50 billion in proposed funding for the office for a single year of operation? And will additional funding be sought for subsequent years? Uh, if so, how much funding do you imagine this requiring annually? Thank you. So obviously more details will be forthcoming about this new office, um, but I will say a few things. The, the office is intended to help us deal with the challenges that we're seeing in our supply chains. I think we all realized during COVID how vulnerable some of our supply chains are too many things have been, are being built offshore. And so we envision the office will have three primary functions. The first is monitoring and commerce is well positioned to do that. So monitoring across critical supply chains to find where there are vulnerabilities for critical pro products. As a side note, I will say a year ago, I was the governor of Rhode Island and struggling with the problems in our supply chain because we couldn't get our, as was as was Tom Wolf, we couldn't get our hands on enough ventilators and enough PPE. So monitoring is one of the key components. A second component will be grants. So we envision making uh, grants out of this office to create new production capacity, particularly for small and medium sized manufacturers so they can could make the make products in America, and then finally an investment arm, uh, which will allow commerce to partner with the private sector to address vulnerabilities and, frankly, get ahead of supply chain resiliency issues. Um, so, and it's envisioned that this money would be spent uh, over several years. Thank you for that. The next question is. Um, about smaller and mid-sized communities, like the ones in my district. They don't have the resources to invest into professional grant writers, and they don't have the ability to monitor grant opportunities. Certainly my staff work around the clock to help our constituents and the, the local uh, municipal officials and chambers of commerce, but we can't be everywhere. What will you do to make sure communities like mine 
are understanding what opportunities are available and getting full consideration as this additional money is spent? Thank you for that question. And again, I, I hear you because as you pointed out, Rhode Island is a small state and a lot of small communities and they don't have the person power to, to do, you know, to do that work in both um, MBDA and EDA. Uh, a significant portion of the funds will be dedicated to doing exactly what you're talking about, which is to say providing local communities technical support and assistance so that they can, in fact, access the monies, do the grant writing, um, hire consultants and such to augment their own staff so that they are able to be eligible uh, successfully for the EDA funding, the MBDA funding, and some of the department's other funding. Well, uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, I haven't I will go into a second round of questioning, but I, I want to uh, yield the floor to uh, Ranking Member Adderholt for five minutes of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, Madam Secretary, Section 232 tariff program uh, could be utilized uh, in a much better way to stem the tide of well-documented subsidies that drive overcapacity in China. Uh, for the aluminum industry in particular, the uh, execution uh, of the program and its exclusion process has actually been hurting domestic aluminum producers rather than actually helping them. In December, the Commerce Department published a round of changes to the exclusion process, but acknowledged technical and policy issues remained. And uh, I believe some of the changes that were made, like the new general approved exclusion, deserves a re-examination. Will you and your team there at the Department of Commerce take a fresh look at the exclusion process and assess the impact on the domestic inter industry to address these various countless problems that we're seeing in the U.S. industry uh, uh, that has highlighted and we're fixing? Yes, yeah, so first of all, I'd like to thank you for your question. Uh, the 232 tariffs were imposed to protect our workers in the steel industry and the aluminum industry from uh, primarily China dumping its highly subsidized cheap steel and aluminum into our markets. Having said that, the exclusions process, which was intended, as you say, to help consuming industries, has um, you know has had challenges, and for a while there were backlogs. I'm very pleased to say. The department has improved and currently it's it, it substantially reduced the amount of time that it takes to receive an exclusion. We're down to about 50 days uh, to grant an exclusion from the time it's asked for to the time it's granted. Having said that, the answer to your question is yes. I, I think there's continued room for improvement and I would welcome an opportunity to visit with you and hear, hear your feedback on how you think we can continue to improve. That'd be great. And, and uh, since the chairman had uh, take the liberty to ask about coming to uh, Pennsylvania, I uh, hope we can schedule something to come down to Alabama at some point. Yes. Also, I need to let you know that my father, believe it or not, went to University of Alabama, which oh. is a story I yes. can share with you when I visit with you. But he was a Italian kid from um, the tenements of Providence. He served in the Second World War and got the GI Bill and went to University of Alabama. So we are big Roll Tide people in my family. Okay. Well, I represent Tuscaloosa, so uh, that would be perfect. Maybe we'll get you over to Tuscaloosa. Uh, let me switch uh, about uh, dealing with weather. Back in March, the, Western, the uh, Washington Post uh, reported that the National Weather Service internet systems uh, were crumbling as key platforms are being taxed and they're failing. Most of the agency's online systems went down during a recent tornado, tornado outbreak here in the South, and a vital resource for relaying information crashed. The agency's office is in Birmingham, and it had to switch to a third-party instant messaging service just to keep people informed. The, uh, these revelations are serious 
because of the concern, and there is a strong bipartisan support for addressing this issue. And it is my hope that fixing these systems will be one of your top priorities um, as you uh, take the helm there at the Department of Commerce. Can you explain what is going on with the dissemination of weather information to the public and what your uh, FY22 budget proposes to try to do about this? Yes, thank you. And I share your concern. Uh, the systems and the IT are older. And the reality is that given the severity and frequency of severe weather events, the demand from the private sector, states, other public entities, tribal entities, the demand <clears throat> for our weather services has been, frankly, outstripping our ability to supply that information. And so, yes, I will commit to you to prioritizing this. Um, the president's discretionary budget uh, calls for over a billion dollars of additional funding into NOAA, and a good portion of that um, ought to be to improve the science, technology, and technological systems, exactly as you say. And I will commit to working with you and prioritizing that. If anything, it's it's more important than ever. And I think it's a billion for that the president calls for into NOAA, and a good part of that will be in improving our technology. Yeah, well, thank you for your commitment on that. And so uh, so I can you're, you're saying with confidence that uh, the FY22 budget includes enough funding to fix the problem as quickly as possible? I am saying that the detail when the details are come out, I will go through them carefully and make sure that that is the case. But yes, I believe the answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Adderholt. This time the chair uh, recognizes uh, overall appropriations chair DeLauro for five minutes of her questions. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Raimondo, uh, you know, uh, uh, by the way, I, I know you were in Joe Courtney's district, so that means there's got to be another trip to Connecticut for my district. And, the, uh, uh, and I, I, I will just say this, and I don't want to take away from your time or my time, but Rhode Island and Connecticut go back and forth as to who has the most Italian Americans, uh, uh, you know, and uh, I fight with Cicilline all the time. It's got to be Connecticut, uh, Madam Secretary. So I know we'll continue to fight as well. Um, as you know, trade enforcement is a critical mission for the Commerce Department. Uh, and to assure that American businesses, workers thrive in that global market, the department has to ensure that we're enforcing the trade laws uh, to make sure that foreign governments play by the rules um, and are in compliance with our international agreements. Can you just talk about what are the trade enforcement priorities you have as Secretary of Commerce moving forward? Um, what is the administration's trade enforcement agenda going to look like uh, to protect American workers and businesses? Yes, thank you. Uh, so, first of all, I couldn't agree more that uh, American workers deserve a level playing field and everybody needs to play by the same rules. That's what this is all about. Mm -hmm. So, we need to disseminate the rules and then enforce the rules and, quite frankly, ensure that our allies enforce the rules. And one of my areas of focus will be to work more closely than, say, the last administration with our allies to align around uh, not only policies but enforcement. So that's enforcement of uh, the entities list, that's enforcement of uh, countervailing anti-dumping and countervailing duties. That's a, an area that I plan to focus significantly mm -hmm. to make sure mm -hmm. that we, we do the enforcement. Uh, IP protection. You know, we have a China uh, team within the Department of Commerce. You know, it's vital that we have strong uh, patents, but also that they're enforced. And so uh, I had a meeting just this morning t talking with ITA to talk about this very issue, which is the rules are only as, as good as the enforcement. And so we intend to uh, execute on that. Thank you. I was really pleased to uh, to see within the last 24 hours that the administration lifted the um, uh, the, the waiver on uh, for uh, India and South Africa to be able to deal with manufacturing 
uh, you know, the vaccines that are needed uh, in those countries, in India particularly, being de devastated. So, uh, you know, th thank you for that. And I know we want to protect inter intellectual property, but you know, when you're looking at intellectual property versus saving lives, I'm so pleased that the administration moved in the direction that you did. Um, uh, let me also ask, there's a three- I'll just, I'll just say on that, Congresswoman, you were clear about that with me when I saw you Monday, right. and I was clear about expressing your strong yes. support. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. It really is a... Um, I can't tell you how, how excited and pleased we all are and what that means uh, for, for those countries. Um, uh, in, in section, um, uh, there's a section 6001 in the American Rescue Plan, there's $3 billion there for the Economic Adjustment Assistance Fund to help communities impacted by loss of travel, tourism. Can you talk about that a little bit and how that might be implemented? Yes, so it's a floor of 750 million out of the 3 billion that will go specifically to travel and tourism. I don't need to tell anyone in this meeting how devastated uh, the travel and tourism industry has been. I saw it in Rhode Island, you see it in Connecticut, small hotels, restaurants, etc. We will be very soon working very hard to get that money out later this spring. Mm -hmm. Uh, 750 million dollars to uh, every state should benefit uh, and we will send it out in grants to communities so that they can use it right away to help mm -hmm. you know get their industry back on track. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much for that. I'm going to, uh, you know, we, we, we can talk at some point about um, you know, again, a little bit outside the, the scope, but, you know, um, you're, you're helping to support and bolster the infrastructure of the care economy, um, which is, I, I think, such a critical uh, issue as we move down the road. Delighted that you are there and look forward to working uh, uh, with you very closely. Thank you so much. And I thank my colleagues, the chair and the ranking member, and yield back my time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair DeLauro. At this time, uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Klein for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you and Ranking Member Adder holding today's hearing. I want to uh, welcome the secretary. I wish we were in person. I saw your testimony before the Senate Appropriations Committee uh, a few weeks back, and it was nice to watch a, a committee working and, and you in front of them answering questions. But uh, uh, this will this will have to do today. Um, as our nation moves forward and continues to recover from the devastating effects brought on by COVID-19, it's vital we're ensuring that businesses can remain open so that our economy is thriving once again. I want to go specifically to an issue that affects my district, lumber prices. Uh, lumber prices have been quite volatile in the wake of the pandemic over the last year. Lumber prices have been skyrocketing with oriented strand board jumping over 250% since March of 2020. A sheet of OSB was around $8 in March of 2020, while today it's well over $60 a sheet and climbing. The National Association of Home Builders says overall lumber prices have tripled, and the increase translates to a nearly $36,000 increase in the price of the average single family home. And as you know, this has ripple effects across our economy. Uh, we're seeing a buying panic as a result around the country as home prices jump. Can you discuss what resources uh, may be available or have been dedicated by the department to look into the causes of skyrocketing lumber prices and what impact this is having on the economy? And can you commit to working with industry stakeholders and with Congress to identify the challenges and potential solutions to the crisis we're experiencing? Thank you for your question. So uh, first, let me say I agree with you that the home building industry and the housing sector um, is a vital portion of our economy uh, and they are struggling as you say. A lot of supply chains have been disrupted during the pandemic. Uh, it isn't just lumber, we see it across the board. I see, I see it across the board in the work that we're doing. So many supply chains have been disrupted. Uh, so recently ITA has been doing a good deal of convening of stakeholders to try to learn exactly why this is happening 
And what I can commit to you is to follow up with you, to work collaboratively with you. I actually would love your guidance on what you think could be done. So right now we're trying to get under the covers of like what's going on, what are the root causes, and then what what can we do at ITA to try to solve the problem? Because I understand the problem and it affects the whole industry. Great, thank you very much. Um, moving over to another uh, industry, Congress established a clear division of responsibility for spectrum management. Uh, as you know, the FCC is responsible for commercial spectrum and NTIA is responsible for federal government spectrum. But in recent years, it seems that other federal agencies um, do think that they are responsible for their own spectrum management rather than NTIA. Uh, how can we ensure that NTIA fulfills its statutory responsibility to manage federal spectrum? Uh, I will assure you that that will happen. So <laughs> as you said, that's NTIA's job. And the truth of it is we have to make more spectrum available if we're going to move forward with 5G and all of the innovation that surrounds 5G and all of the job creation that will come in America if we lead in 5G. And so um, sometimes that means NTIA may have challenging conversations with say the DOD, but that is what needs to happen. And so we are going to have led by NTIA, a whole of government spectrum strategy uh, I've actually already talked to Secretary Austin about this, and he is eager to be collaborative. That's, and that's that led by NTIA. That is led by NTIA, absolutely. NTIA okay. needs to drive the bus on coming up with that whole of government strategy. Okay, good. Um, one more question before my time runs out. Sometimes the FCC's role as the manager of commercial spectrum and NTIA's role as the manager of federal spectrum come into conflict. Uh, how can we ensure that the FCC and NTIA work in partnership uh, rather than cross purposes to address spectrum management issues that impact federal and commercial entities? Yeah, so what I'll tell you quickly is this is a priority of mine. I've already reached out to the acting chair of the FCC. It's relationships, it's collaboration, it's better mapping, better data, um, and as I said, NTIA leading in concert uh, uh, whole of government strategy. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Klein. At this time, the chair recognizes uh, Congresswoman Grace Meng of New York. And Ms. Meng, we're not buying that phony background, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were too smart for that. <laughs> you recognize the phony. of my Queens, New York City yard. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Madam Secretary, and congratulations. Um, thank you, Chairman and Ranking Member Adderholtz, um, for convening us today. Um, Madam Secretary, I wanted to ask, you serve as a co-chair of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, um, which is critical to ensuring the full participation of APAs in this country. Um, last year, Congress included a provision in the annual spending bill directing commerce to submit a report to the subcommittee on how it intends to ensure uh, the initiative is a good fit at MBDA versus previous administrations under departments of education and HHS. So can you discuss what your vision is for the initiative at MBDA and how can it coordinate with local Asian American community groups and other federal agencies. Thank you for the question. And it was nice to see you yesterday at the API event. So first of all, I would say that MBDA has a great deal of expertise in convening stakeholders, working with local chambers. They are, have already and will continue to do a lot of convening and consultation with Asian American chambers. Um, this is what they are good at. And, 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 and then we'll use that information to provide support in two areas particularly. One is technical assistance, especially helping Asian American owned businesses, especially small businesses, get federal contracts, improve exports, you know, 
technical help for them, and then secondly, grants. So, uh, in fact, I have it here. MBDA assisted AAPI-owned businesses secure more than $235 million in contracts and $120 million in capital in fiscal year 20. So that's, and that's a floor, right? Like, a, and the president's budget, this budget that we're talking about now, 22, calls for significant more investment in MBDA. And we ought to work together to make sure that the uh, Asian American business community is, you know, gets their fair share, frankly. Thank you so much. And Madam Secretary, if we can be uh, of any help, either nationally or even in and around the region of New York, um, please uh, don't hesitate. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the census. Um, you know, just just keep trying to think about how we approach this as a country uh, over the past two years or so um, in conducting this last census. And you know, thinking that a majority of Americans have smartphones now, giving them the ability to search information while on the go. Um, according to a Pew Research survey, nearly 80% of Americans were cited as having a smartphone. So I just wonder if there is uh, any thought or uh, ability to consider federal agencies like Commerce using a smartphone app or something that can be done on the go and more easily than just paper, for example, um, to help people fill out uh, the census? Yes, such a good question. And the answer is we need to get there. Um, as a mother of two teenagers, I don't think my kids are going to be able to do anything without their smartphone. So yes, we have to get there if we're going to engage everyone. The Census Bureau now uses uh, what they call responsive website design, which is, you know, mobile friendly, but with more resources, the Census Bureau could definitely explore um, other options to support what you're talking about, mobile app development. And I would have to get back to you to give you a number on exactly how much that would cost. But I think, um, you know, designing that kind of mobile app would be an excellent, you know, an excellent thing to do. Thank you. Look forward to it. Um, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Meng. And uh, at this time, the chair recognizes Mr. Garcia for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Chairman uh, Cartwright and uh, Madam Secretary. It's a pleasure to meet you. Hopefully we can see each other in person one of these days, hopefully soon. Congratulations on the appointment and, uh, uh, and I wish you the best of luck on, on, this, uh, on this very challenging mission that we collectively have here. Uh, I, I wanna go back to uh, a discussion that you were having earlier about the, the entity list, specifically the uh, China team. Um, I know, you know, DOD and State Department share a, a responsibility to ensure ITAR controlled items are, are going to the right folks. Um, and, and given the environment that we're seeing right now with China effectively pirating and, and stealing a lot of our IP and technologies real time, something that seems like innocuous technology or, or, or early generation technology, they're actually able to evolve further and use against us. Um, can you speak a little bit deeper about what the China team is doing and how uh, commerce is, is looking at enforcing uh, the regulations, the licensing, the, the controls of uh, inherent and embedded in some of these licenses underneath the entity list? Yes, um, thank you for the question. I guess I would say, first I would say, you know, President Biden has been crystal clear with us, his team, that the uh, competition with China is among our top priorities. It is real, it is significant. China has proven over and over again that it's willing to be anti-competitive, coercive, violate human rights, steal our technology, use it against us. And so the, the first thing I, you need to know is that we are taking it incredibly seriously and we're gonna be as tough as we need to be. So as a matter of policy or I guess strategy. The second thing is um, uh, with respect to technology, you're exactly right. I mean, which is why we have the entities list. Since I've been Commerce Secretary, we've already issued 
uh, five or six, don't quote me the exact number, subpoenas to Chinese companies because uh, we want to, we're not, we're not joking around. I mean, we, if we are going to enforce the requirement and we're going to do that to the fullest extent, extent possible. And then, as I think I said to one of your colleagues, where, I, where we want to move is identify what's the key technology, like the absolutely core technology, choke points, and then work with our allies to make sure that they also aren't letting you know, China get their hands on this technology and then work with them for rigorous enforcement. Great. I, I appreciate that sentiment. I think, you know, obviously that's a bipartisan national security uh, concern. It's a real threat. So uh, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I, I think the, a byproduct of that, you know, you kind of alluded to it is, is finding those not only those choke points, but also those dependencies. Uh, we're seeing in a lot of industries right now a dependency on uh, microchip semiconductor mimic uh, technology coming out of China. Uh, and, and whether it was, you know, inadvertent in the, in the, in the heels of the pandemic uh, or not, you know, is, is debatable, but uh, it's, been a, it's, it's had a real impact on industry and production here. Car manufacturers closing down lines, et cetera. So that's uh, encouraging to hear that that will be in the spotlight. Uh, if I may pivot real quick, a uh, completely different subject. Uh, there's about a $500 million plug for uh, NOAA Next Generation Satellites. Uh, I represent a district in California that is uh, susceptible and, and vulnerable, frankly, to, to wildfires on an annual basis, almost year round now. Uh, I supported uh, an initiative to help NOAA stand up an artificial intelligence uh, center uh, with the, uh, one of the missions being to help uh, predictive and modeling analysis for wildfires. Uh, can you touch on um, NOAA's responsibility and, and how uh, they're progressing and helping us not only fight fires, but uh, detect the wildfires and, and plan assets around that uh, briefly? Yes. Um, so first I would say, with your permission, I'd love to go deeper on that and come back to you, give you a proper sure. answer of exactly what they've done. But okay. what I can tell you is, um, well, really every, what you just said, which is the $500 million is for next generation satellites. We're making a big push generally in NOAA to improve the weather service, the weather technology, um, supercomputers. Much of this money is to invest in basically next generation science so that we can uh, have the data necessary and then also continue to do an even better job disseminating that information to cities, towns, tribes, localities, the private sector. My opinion is that the value of this data is going to go up a lot in the coming years due to the extreme weather events, and that will be a focus of mine. But I owe you a proper, deeper answer on exactly what's been done um, with the Wildfire Weather Service, and I'll get back to you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. My time's up. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Mr. Case, you are recognized for five minutes. Aloha, Madam Secretary. I represent um, Hawaii and with uh, due respect uh, to Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Alabama, we also invite you here. Uh, the, um, the directions are not that complex. Uh, just get on a plane and head west for <clears throat> 10 hours uh, looking for the sun. Uh, you should be able to find us. So uh, we hope to see you uh, sometime perhaps after your summer visit to Mr. Cartwright's uh, district. Um, and um, by the way, I... Um, I completely endorse my colleagues' questions and your answers on NOAA. Um, as you've seen, I think three colleagues before me have talked about the critical importance of NOAA uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, climate change, of course, being our, our number one challenge from a NOAA perspective, but also uh, the cutting edge oceanographic research that NOAA does, fisheries management, our fisheries are endangered around our world, and finally, just basic atmospheric observation at places like Mauna Loa. Uh, here in Hawaii who, who have really led in climate change. And so uh, please take us uh, at our word in our support uh, for full support for NOAA. The last four years have been, uh, have been defensive and we want to we wanna go on the offense again with NOAA. <clears throat> Let me follow up on travel and tourism because, you know, you recognize the importance in your comments, but I want to drive that point home with you and ask you some very specific uh, questions. 
I don't think that most people realize the impact of, of travel and tourism to our national uh, economy. Uh, before COVID-19, uh, U.S. travel and tourism accounted for about $2 trillion in economic output. It accounted for somewhere in the range of 16 uh, million jobs. It was our second largest industry export after transportation. That surprises people sometimes. Our second largest export industry in our entire country. Uh, people like to live here, uh, visit here, and that's an export industry. Uh, it was our seventh largest private employer. It has been devastated. Everybody always says that, but I don't think people realize the extent of devastation of uh, U.S. travel and tourism. A loss of uh, somewhere around half of that uh, economic output, um, reduction in jobs by 30 to 40 percent, a reduction in federal, state, and county revenues um, as a result. And I want to say to you that the response um, across the board by our federal government in terms of emergency assistance has been very, very uneven for travel and tourism. Uh, we've seen aspects of travel and tourism, such as the airline industry, which saw $75 billion of assistance in the restaurant industry, which is seeing right now about $25 a billion of assistance. And so $750 million uh, that you are administering with the, um, the EDA right now, which I'm grateful for, doesn't really match up in terms of the overall impact uh, to travel and tourism. Um, the U.S. travel, and, and so in all, in all honesty, um, we feel as part of the industry that we're getting lost in the shuffle. Um, and part of that, I believe, has to do with um, the, 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 the position given travel and tourism within the Department of Commerce, um, where it is, frankly, a, a sub-agency. I mean, it is an agency, but, um, you know, many, many countries around the world treat travel and tourism as a, as, as a major um, um, area from the perspective of government organization and focus at the sub-cabinet, even sometimes cabinet uh, level. Um, the U.S. Travel and Tourism Advisory Board, which is the formal um, advisor to, um, um, to the Department of Commerce, to you on travel and tourism, sent you a letter on March 4th um, providing specific uh, recommendations on what the federal government can do. And one of their primary recommendations to you was elevate travel and tourism within the Department of Commerce up to the sub-cabinet uh, level, create an assistant secretary for travel and tourism, uh, create uh, a national, uh, I'm sorry, U.S. travel and tourism agency headed by an assistant secretary. Do you have thoughts yet on whether you can support that recommendation to give far more um, emphasis and focus uh, to national travel and tourism policy coming out of COVID-19? Yeah. So first of all, let me say, uh, I did receive that letter. And shortly thereafter, on May, um, March 31st, I convened and I attended for over an hour uh, I chaired a meeting of that U.S. Travel and Tourism Advisory Board and had a great discussion hearing from them their issues, including the Assistant Secretary idea. And I'm planning on chairing a meeting of the Tourism Policy Council shortly to discuss further. I agree with you that the 750 isn't enough. It's important, and I'm working hard to get it out the door quickly. I do think there is... Um, merit to the assistant secretary position. I'm not in a position to obviously commit to that on behalf of the administration, but I will tell you from my position as secretary of commerce, I am hearing it over and over and I think there's merit to it. And I would look forward to, you know, discussing it further with you and with the industry when I'm doing all of this convening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Case. This time the chair recognizes Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence of Michigan for five minutes of questions. Thank you so much. It is always a pleasure to meet with you again, Secretary. Um, I have a few questions. Um, when you met with the Women's Caucus, I just wanted to reiterate uh, how important it is if we build back better that we can continue the commitment to ensure that women are included in the training and the job opportunities and the investment in small businesses. As you know, women during this pandemic has been hit harder. Uh, the majority of the job loss and all that has fallen in the uh, area of women and women owned businesses. So I want to ask a question from day one Biden, uh, our president and the administration have been working to fulfill its promise to build back better. And that 
these actions represent a strong commitment. And however, I want to stress the importance of Building Back Better that represents all of America. Can you provide, I will, I would like to ask a question through the agencies like the EDA, the MBDA, uh, as they continue to assist businesses across the country, how can we ensure that women, minority-owned business, and traditionally underserved businesses are included in these efforts? Thank how are we going to monitor it? Yeah. So first of all, thank you for the question. Secondly, this is a as a former female business owner myself, um, I, I, this is a top priority of mine. And of course, the president is very clear. Build back better means build back more equitably. Yes. And uh, so in, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I can okay. hear you. Okay. Uh, in the uh, 2022 budget, the president calls for an increase of more than $20 million for MBDA and to elevate the office to, to have an assistant secretary and authorize the, the MBDA office, which I think is absolutely vital to your point of accountability, uh, that is critical. So what I can tell you is in that office, we are uh, committed to making sure that the money gets to minority-owned businesses and women-owned businesses as necessary. Similarly, in EDA, I mean, I'll, I will commit to that everything we do in commerce, we will have an equity lens and make sure that the money that we put out into the community is done with stakeholder engagement and also, um, you know, with transparency so that you will have accountability. So Congress, you, you ought to have me back here in a year and two years and say, you know, show us money has been spent, that it'll be done in an equitable way. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that commitment. We will keep repeating it because we know that we don't want anyone to get distracted. I too, as all of these amazing in, uh, invitations have come to you, you know that Southeastern Michigan, which I represent, has about 200,000 high paying direct manufacturing jobs. And the field is among the most technology advance and innovation. And production is forecast to continue increasing over the next three uh, decades. What we have found in Michigan is that we have the infrastructure and we're growing it and you know, re-innovating to ensure that we stay competitive. I want to speak for the Midwest. We are locked ready and ready to roll to ensure that manufacturing continues as we have seen it lose its place. If we're going to build back better, that means reinvesting in our manufacturing and stop sending it overseas. And so I would love to invite you to Detroit and to have you sit down with some of our innovators in our manufacturing industry to discuss how we can partner and build back better in the manufacturing area. And we can expand it to the, mid, to the Midwest and have a Midwestern conference on building back the manufacturing industry. And thank you with that, I'll yield back. Thank you. My, uh, my in-laws all live in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Oh yeah. So I have. That's where Central Michigan. I went to college. Yeah. That's where they were professors. At, they are Chippewas at CMU. Oh, so. great! Be good to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you, Ms. Lawrence, and uh, and now the chair will recognize Mr. Trone of Maryland for five minutes. And during your questioning, Mr. Trone, the chair. Uh, expects that you will be obeying all speed limits and traffic signals. Uh-oh, I scared him away. Do we have a problem we need to discuss? <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a connection problem. Oh, Mr. Boy. Trone, you're recognized for five minutes if you could do it. Do you hear me now? Yes. No, I can't hear you. 
You're muted. Looks like you're muted, Mr. Tron. Okay, how are we looking now? I hit it okay, again. now I can hear you. Oh, man, it was... Great to see you again. Um, I really enjoyed our visit uh, to Gaithersburg, Maryland, to the NIST uh, facility for the vaccines. Uh, that was a good trip, and we really appreciate it. I think you and I were both blown away uh, by what's happening at NIST uh, from developing tools uh, to advance biomanufacturing, uh, biotherapeutics, uh, developing strategies related to new carbon sequestration to help address climate change, uh, the one-of-a-kind fire research lab, and search and rescue robots. I mean, so much is happening at NIST. Uh, it's just fantastic. And while NIST is on the cutting edge of innovation and its facilities, they're from the 1960s. So currently NIST has over $800 million in deferred maintenance backlog. And it's only growing each year. And we all know that deferring maintenance only leads to more costly repairs uh, once we have to make them. Uh, right before the pandemic, we had pipe infrastructure, flooded the labs, over $5 million. Repeated HVAC shutdowns, causing everybody to relocate the entire campus. Uh, the current facilities condition assessment found 58% of the buildings are poor or critical condition. Uh, so the question is, how can we expect NIST uh, to help us uh, deal with these leaking pipes, infrastructure, uh, so we continue the cutting edge technology. So if you could speak to your priorities around expanding NIST and supporting NIST. Yeah, so thank you for the question. And I also enjoyed meeting you and I appreciate you coming with me to that visit. I was like you both blown away with the quality of the science. And also we saw it with our own eyes. The buildings have seen better days and we have cataloged uh, the needs. As you say, there's a huge backlog. The president's fiscal 2022 budget includes um, almost a $500 million addition for uh, NIST. And while the details of that haven't yet been released, I can just assure you, and we'll stay in touch, that it, it, this is a very much on our radar and a top priority. It's not um, everybody that works there deserves to be able to go to work in a place that is safe. And secondly, uh, we're making massive investments in artificial intelligence, research and development, et cetera. And we need to also improve the capital facilities there. And so uh, as the budget details become available, we can continue this dialogue, but rest assured that, you know, there'll be significant funding there. And it's definitely a priority of mine having been, you know, visited and seen it with my own eyes. Oh, okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Let's jump to cyber attacks, you know, increasing threat, not just to the government, uh, but also the business world that you come from and I come from. And I would say Homeland Security, other defense intelligence agencies play a leading role, but NIST has an important role here too. I'd like you to ask you, tell us as much as you can publicly about the extent of the impacts to the Department of the Solar Winds hack and how much have we recovered from the damage that was done? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you know, it was significant. And as a result, we are taking it very, very seriously. I can assure you that um, cyber will continue to be a main area of focus for NIST. Actually, in, in Rockville, Maryland, NIST has the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and cyber will continue to be a, a great focus for us. I 
as I said, there'll be a lot more money coming into NIST. Commerce is also at the center of the ICTS work that the, the president signed his executive order on that. And in that work, we're going to be not only securing, you know, federal government um, networks, but also looking to help small and medium sized companies who are increasingly hit with these attacks and frankly, uh, don't necessarily know how to handle it. And so that will be a, c a continued focus for us. Well, we, you anticipated my next question, and that was helping those small businesses who can't respond like government can. So uh, thank you uh, very, very much for that. Uh, with that, Madam Secretary, it's great seeing you, and I yield back as a chairman. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trone. Uh, we have now uh, finished our first round of questioning. And uh, Madam Secretary, uh, I'll offer you a 10 minute recess if you would like one. It looks like we have about another 20 minutes of questioning. Uh, what's your pleasure? I'm happy to keep going if you guys are, if that's okay. Very good. In that case, I will recognize myself uh, for a second round of questions. Uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, about innovation and manufacturing. There are numerous proposals currently working their way through Congress about how to improve American innovation. And I certainly support many of these initiatives, but I worry that we may be missing a bigger issue. Uh, America is already pretty good at innovation. The problem is taking that intellectual property, holding on to it and converting it into American manufacturing facilities so that the middle class sees the direct effect on jobs. I know this is a, a part of your personal story, seeing American manufacturing uh, uh, depart our shores, uh, and you're welcome to comment on that. But here's the thing, we invented solar panels and semiconductors, but neither are being manufactured much here at all because other countries have stolen the intellectual property or are so heavily subsidized uh, in manufacturing that we struggle to compete. So the question is, what are we doing to address these problems and increase American competitiveness? How do we convert American innovation into family sustaining blue collar jobs? Thank you for the question. And you're right, this is a passion of mine. For those of you who don't know me, I come from Rhode Island. Uh, Rhode Island was once the jewelry manufacturing capital of the world. Uh, we had tons of jewelry manufacturing jobs here. My dad worked at the Bull of a Watch Company. There were over a thousand people working there in its heyday. When he was 56, after 28 years, he was, you know, the factory closed, all the jobs went to China, and it was really tough for my family and our whole, our whole community. So I have religion on this topic, and I believe strongly that this is our moment to reshore a lot of manufacturing and create millions of decent paying family supporting manufacturing jobs, and it'll be a primary focus of what I do. Uh, I think there's... I'll be very brief. There's things we can do on offense and things we can do on defense. Uh, on offense, we need to invest. You know, we need to make capital available to small and medium-sized manufacturers. The president's budget for commerce calls for big increases in the manufacturing extension partnership. I did, I worked that as governor. We always had much more demand than supply. This absolutely will create manufacturing jobs advanced manufacturing in innovation. The president's budget calls for a, manuf a manufacturing innovation center around semiconductors, making more semiconductors in America. We, we don't make enough semiconductors in America. So I think big investments in research and development, job training, access to capital for manufacturers, playing offense so we can reshore uh, manufacturing, playing defense also, you know, tariffs, if necessary, like I talked about with the ranking member, uh, uh, countervailing duties and anti-dumping, half enforcement, um, export control, so China can get their hands on our technology so they can flourish. I really do believe the next 10 plus years, we can see a resurgence of manufacturing jobs in America. I That is the president's 
you know, focus and belief. And I'm going to use the full set of tools in the commerce toolbox um, to do everything I can against that goal. I'm glad to hear that. Um, and now, Madam Secretary, you also uh, did talk a little bit about intellectual property theft, and I want to give you a chance to expand on that. How do we deal with IP theft issues, especially with countries like China? Yes. Well, first of all, I think it starts with having strong uh, patent protection at home. And, you know, my job, of course, will be to administer an effective, efficient, strong patent system through the USPTO. Um, and then secondly, we have to enforce the laws to the greatest extent possible and get our allies to do the same. This is a challenging issue, and I would welcome any advice from any of you at any time. China, China doesn't respect our IP. They break the rules. And so we it comes back to what I talked about with your colleague. It's about enforcement. And I can just say that under my watch at Commerce, we're going to spend as much time on enforcement across everything that we do uh, as we are on promulgating policies. Well, I thank you for that, Secretary Raimondo. And, and I want to uh, yield the floor at this time to our ranking member, Mr. Adelholt, for five more minutes of questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to follow up on the same line of questioning from the chairman and also uh, from Mr. Garcia uh, regarding uh, technology. Uh, the Bureau of Industry and Security administers the U.S. export control regime to ensure that technology that is uh, sensitive to our national security does not make it into the hands of our adversaries. And yet, uh, uh, as one of my colleagues, Representative McCall, uh, from Texas, uh, who is also the ranking member on the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, appropriately noted just this week that one of the biggest challenges in our competition with the Chinese Communist Party is uh, is over the access to critical critical technology and its supply chain. Yet our efforts to identify and control these emerging and foundational technologies are woefully insufficient and risk turning into a hollow exercise. Why, my question is why uh, has the Bureau of Industry and Security not fully implemented the key provisions of the Export Control Reform Act, such as the emerging and foundational technology list? Could you speak to that? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, we are in the process of doing that. And as I have said I, it's a priority of ours. I think I may have mentioned I, you know, I've been here for seven weeks and we've already issued seven subpoenas against Chinese companies to enforce our uh, export controls and and we will continue to do that. The president's budget calls for increased funding for BIS and ITA and some of that will be used for um, uh, more aggressive or, or comprehensive um, efforts in BIS around export controls. Uh, I think you're on mute. Okay, housebound. Is that good? All right, thank you. Oh, you. Uh, May may or may not have seen the Wall Street Journal article that was uh, dated April the 28th uh, of this year, and it includes concerns about whether the uh, FAA is responding forcefully enough regarding violations which pertains to commercial launch activities. Um, meanwhile, the FCC is managing the use of space for competing satellite systems. My question it, it would be to you is, if the Commerce Department's Office of Space Commerce uh, takes on a greater role in the regulation of space operations, what can you do or what would you do to make sure that the office maintains equal treatment to competitors and stands firm on regulations and consequences as opposed to becoming a pass-through agency through, uh, for almost any commercial launch idea? Mm -hmm. So thank you. 
for the question. I um, So first let me say, I think this is an exciting area of commerce, Office of Space Commerce, where I predict over the next five to 10 years, we will see a lot more activity. And as a result, we have to, um, I think we need a real whole of government approach to come up with our strategy in, around regulations in space commerce. Uh, I think there will be a lot more commercial opportunity in the, in space commerce, and it will be important for us to encourage that innovation, but also regulate. And by the way, everybody has to play by the same rules. I'm not sure exactly what that article was, but you know, I've seen articles about certain entrepreneurs who think they don't have to follow the rules. And I think we have to be very clear that they do. So this, uh, my uh, incoming deputy, uh, Don Graves plans to really lead around space commerce. I have a background as an innovation investor, and we'd be happy to visit with you on this because I think working with the FCC, defense, transportation, commerce has an important role to play, and it is regulation, but it's also you know innovation because I think there'll be a lot more commerce down here. Okay, thank you. And I would also like to associate myself uh, the comments that made uh, that Mr. Klein regard into to timber uh, and lumber. Uh, I uh, I am hearing that uh, constantly uh, in the as I am down in the state of Alabama in the district. Uh, I understand that uh, there's plenty of lumber that's being delivered. Uh, but uh, the prices are continuing to go up, and uh, I think there's an issue with production. So if you could uh, make this uh, a priority to find out uh, what what we can do to try to, because it is really putting a lot of uh, uh, folks uh, in a very difficult position uh, for uh, own building and uh, various construction projects. And so uh, if you could uh, ask someone in your office to, to make that a priority, I think that's very important. I promise you I will. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Adderholt. Uh, Mr. Klein, you're recognized for an additional five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for uh, going through a second round of questions. I want to pivot back to China and, and review uh, something you said a month ago uh, in a White House press briefing. Uh, I'm quoting you. China's actions are uncompetitive, coercive, underhanded, They've proven they will do whatever it takes, and so I plan to use all the tools in my toolbox, and you said that again today, as aggressively as possible to protect American workers and businesses from unfair Chinese practices. So using that line of thinking, wouldn't it be uh, using all the tools in your toolbox as aggressively as possible to force ByteDance to sell TikTok? And wouldn't it also be aggressive to uh, place Huawei on the department's entity list? Huawei is on the department's entity list, and there's no reason to think that they will... Well, to keep them, yeah. Yeah, that, right, that's right, exactly. There's, and I was going to say there's no reason to think that they will be removed from that entity list, and we are um, going through a review to figure out you know, constantly what other companies might also find themselves on the entity list. So anyway, I did, I want, I know that came up in my confirmation and I wanted to clarify that. Well, and then I, I appreciate that. And and I, I just want to get a status report on that review of China policy. It, it was over a month ago. You said that uh, you were, you, reviews were ongoing and I just want to figure out when those are going to conclude and hopefully we can see that aggressive stance toward China uh, renewed here in the immediate future. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is something um, being led by the White House in, 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 in the interagency process. And I think it's, a, it's ongoing. I, you know, later on the spring, early summer, I think we'll be continuing to flesh it out. In the meantime, uh, we aren't stopping. You know, we are, in my department, I can tell you, uh, we, are, we are being aggressive, appropriately so, um, with enforcement. I mentioned the subpoenas a couple of times and with keeping these companies on the entities list and deciding where new companies have to come on. I am glad that you're uh, 
supportive of keeping Huawei on the entity list. Um, you mentioned also a strong patent system, and I, I share that position. Um, but last year, an OIG report highlighted deficiencies in the PTO's patent capture and application processing system. Uh, the report found that PTO has no assurance that can, it can restore critical applications in the event of system failure or a cyber attack, and that the US PTO's continued delay in updating legacy systems rendered a $4 million per year alternate processing site inadequate and impractical. Um, I want to ask, given the PTO's mission to foster innovation, competitiveness, and economic growth, it's no surprise that PTO and its applicants wish to secure their property rights uh, and, and that those rights rely heavily on a dependable IT infrastructure to achieve this mission. Um, the OIG report made several recommendations, and I understand the PTO is working to address them. Do you have an update on that? Can you provide us um, an update on that and whether they have implemented these recommendations? So thank you for bringing this up. I I understand the significance of the issue, and I am going to have to get back to you with details. I I will do that, and I will submit the answer, you know, for the record. Thank you. I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Mr. Garcia, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, again, thanks for the, uh, the patience on this and uh, withering the storm. Uh, I was encouraged uh, by your words, your desire to be uh, more competitive as a nation on the open market uh, in terms of supporting businesses and, and encouraging business growth throughout our country, and uh, especially relative to China becoming more competitive. Uh, in 2017, we had the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which was really the catalyst for a booming economy over the last five years. Uh, we saw massive job growth, uh, record low employment numbers. Uh, we saw companies hiring at record pace. We saw those same companies investing in, in internal research and development as a result of the corporate tax breaks. Uh, we saw them in parallel lowering their prices of goods and products to Americans while also increasing wages to the average employee, uh, employees on their books. Um, that to me was the essence of being competitive. I wasn't a fan of the state and local tax deduction cap uh, being a Californian. I think that could have been removed. Uh, but I do believe that the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act uh, was the answer for being competitive on the open market space. Uh, as we pivot to, to this administration and specifically this year under uh, this President Biden's uh, uh, tax plan, uh, what we're seeing is effectively a doubling of the tax rate on, on material long-term capital gains from 20% to 40%, to uh, eliminating the qualified income deduction for partnerships and S-Corps, increasing the corporate tax rate from 21% to 28%, adding a new 12.4% high earner payroll tax on all income earners above $400,000, uh, raising the top individual tax rate back up to 39.6% from 37%. Uh, these are the folks who are creating jobs or they're, they're creating incomes, which ultimately drive revenue growth at the national and state levels for us. Uh, yet this tax plan seems to be uh, almost punishing those companies that are doing well and those small business owners who, frankly, right now are just starting to recover on the heels of the pandemic. And I, I come from a state that's overly taxed uh, and, and it's crushing our businesses here at the state level. Uh, but this administration seems to be adopting the same mindset that Sacramento has, has adopted in terms of, of tax uh, and, and not being business friendly, uh, overlaying bureaucracy and regulation on small businesses at a time where they desperately need the help. Um, I, I've read your bio, I've seen your, your background, and I, and I know as, as someone who's been involved with, with, with the treasurer and economics, uh, I would love to just get your personal opinion as to whether you think increasing taxes on corporations and small business owners and those who are creating jobs is actually making us uh, as a nation more competitive on the world market for businesses and, and those uh, seeking to invest in those businesses. Thank you. Um, so I was like, we could probably go out for dinner and talk about this for two hours, but I'll give you my thoughts sure. in a minute and 50 seconds. Uh, I agree that the tax structure has to be competitive and fair. I think that this country's economy 
um, could be much, much stronger if we make the big investments that the president is calling for in infrastructure. And in the past month and a half, I've talked to probably 70 CEOs of big companies and dozens and dozens of small companies, and that everyone agrees we need broadband investments, airports, trains, infrastructure, transit, et cetera, housing. And I think it's responsible to pay for that. And, and so the president has set forth a plan, which I think is very strong, will make us competitive. And he has promised he's not going to increase taxes on anyone who makes less than $400,000 a year. And, and w the fact is he proposes significant tax cuts for middle income, working class, lower income Americans who I think deserve a break. So, you know, last year, uh, as you say, many businesses were extremely successful. We had many big, large, multi-billion dollar profitable companies in America that paid zero in taxes. And that, to me, just says the corporate tax code is, is broken if there's so many. They, 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 if I may reclaim, sorry, Madam Speaker, but if I may reclaim, they, they, they net zero in overall tax uh, payments as a result of government rebates, but in, in, in actuality, they are paying taxes. They are creating jobs that ultimately are contributions to the tax rolls uh, at the national and state level. And I would submit that just because your taxes aren't going up, uh, if you're less than 400K, you may actually be losing your job. Uh, and so, yes, there may come a tax cut in the form of being unemployed because your employer is no longer in business. But I would love to sit down and have that conversation over dinner. I, I, you're right, five minutes doesn't do it justice, but I, I would really appreciate having someone advocating for small businesses and taxpayers in this administration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Garcia, and I want to congratulate you, Mr. Garcia. Just about everybody on this subcommittee invited the witness to their district, I think except you, but you scored a dinner invitation from the witness you are right? indeed one of those <laughs> smooth-talking Californians. <laughs> well, we have good food out here, and it'll it'll cost a little bit more, Madam Secretary, but love to have you out here. <laughs> and Madam thank Secretary, you, thank you for your presence today at this hearing. Uh, uh, you have uh, acquitted yourself uh, very well in your maiden voyage before this subcommittee, and I congratulate you. We, look, we all look forward to working with you. Uh, in, in support of small businesses and middle class Americans. And with that, uh, I declare this hearing is adjourned. Thank you all.